Good morning, everybody. Um, we're hit 10 a.m. now, so I, I think I'll get things started. I'm Camille Brouard. I'm the Senior Marketing Executive here at my HR Toolkit, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, although I can see a, a few customers have come on today, um, my HR Toolkit provides HR software specifically tailored for SMEs. And we run an ongoing program of webinars covering a variety of HR and business topics. So today we're going to be looking at achieving employee compliance in your business. So we'll be covering why employee compliance is important and what it can cost to get it wrong, using compliance to protect your business and some essential compliance cornerstones you need to be aware of. Uh, following the presentation, which will last around 20 minutes today, we'll also have time to answer your questions in the Q&A area. So basically, if you just have a little look on the Zoom menu, there is a Q&A box. Um, so feel free to add questions here um, as we go through the webinar to be answered in the Q&A. Um, do get involved in the chat as well on Zoom, but if you do have a question specifically for the Q&A, do make sure to answer it, ask it in the Q&A area uh, so we don't sort of lose sight of your question in the chat. Um, as a little note, today's session is offering general and not legal advice. Um, and just before we sort of move on to today's webinar, um, I'd be remiss not to let you know about our next webinar because it's also on business compliance, um, specifically on having great policies and procedures for your small business. And um, if this is of interest, I'm just going to quick add a link to this in the chat. So I'll just put that in here. So if you want to register for that one, um, that's the registration page. And um, also, we have a brand spanking new guide. Um, all about small business compliance and sort of some of the different rules and regulations that, that you need to get used to, um, written by regulatory consultant Stuart Saunders. Um, so if some more written materials are of interest to you as well, um, I'll just pop in a link to that guide. Um, and now that I've flooded you with the links in the chat, um, I will move on to today's webinar. Um, so here to talk to us this morning about employee compliance is Charlotte Hudson. Charlotte is an HR consultant with Progeny HR Consultancy and Advice. With a strong focus on employment law and risk assessment, she aims to help clients get the most out of their most valuable asset, their people. So Progeny pride themselves on offering commercial and pragmatic HR solutions and advice to businesses across the UK, no matter their requirements. So Charlotte, fantastic to have you here with us today. Hi, good morning, Hi, thanks yeah. for having me. Okay, um, so I do believe you've got some slides to share with us. Um, so if we can hand over to, to your screen share. Uh, that can come up. Fabulous, yeah, can see that all clear? Fabulous. And uh, yeah, I will, I'll let you crack on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the introduction, Camille. Let's get straight, straight in there then. Um, so a brief sort of, overview of what we're going to cover this morning. Um, we're going to talk about what we mean by employee compliance. We're going to look at three key areas of focus. We're going to talk about how we can use employee compliance to protect your business and also um, a quick summary of the first steps that you can take in ensuring that you are compliant. It's worth noting that um, in reality HR compliance is uh, ongoing, ever-changing, there are lots of considerations to take into account, such as legislative changes, changes in best practice, and of course, the commercial needs of your business. So there really isn't a one size fits all approach, but hopefully today's webinar will give you some good ideas and potentially some quick fixes um, to help you get a handle on compliance in your business. So what is employee compliance? In this context, we're talking about employee compliance being um, how your business is compliant when it employs people, employees. Um, so there are three core areas to think about here. We've got statutory compliance, and that relates to the statutory rules that are set by the government, um, such as working hours and rest breaks. Failure to adhere to statutory compliance rules, if you like, can result in a variety of legal claims. The second core area is regulatory compliance. Regulatory compliance is when a regulatory body, such as the HSE, for example, um, is responsible for issuing legal obligations to employers, such as providing a safe place to work. And the final core area, and the one that you can sort of tie everything up in, is contractual compliance. 
So contractual compliance is when we ensure that the contractual terms of employment are fair, they comply with all the statutory and regulatory requirements, and they're agreed by both parties. Ultimately, though, the key part of remaining compliant, and, and we could probably see this as a recurrent strand throughout, is that your records and information need to be kept and stored properly. So for me, um, there are three key areas that you can focus on really to get your compliance right, or at least get a really good start on it. Um, contracts and new starter paperwork, and this also includes your new uh, right to work checks, which we're going to talk about in a bit more detail shortly. Um, your policies and procedures and your record keeping. So first of all, before we start talking about contracts, when, um, we're going to do a poll, Camille, if that's okay, um, when do we think that we should be issuing a contract of employment? Can we, yes, there we go. Okay, I've just launched that poll now. Um, so anyone who's keen, yeah, we've got some answers coming in. I'll just leave that for a little bit longer so everyone's got a, a chance to answer if they like. Um, it's fully anonymous, by the way. Um, so we're not gonna be saying, oh, so-and-so said, said this answer. <laughs> okay, I'll just give that a few more seconds. Okay, I think that's most people have answered. So I'll just share the results and, and sort of read those out. Um, so uh, it seems that people think mostly that um, it's when the job's offered or on the first day um, that there should be a, a contract of employment. Um, a few people have said within the first weeks and no, at first eight weeks, and nobody said never. Well, that's good news. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Can I close that off? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that, Camille. Yeah, so uh, lots of you are already aware of the importance of a contract. Um, it's the state, the statement of main terms can be different to a contract, and that is a day one right. So um, a statement of main terms covers a variety of topics and, and terms of the offer, if you like. Now, it's my view that um, if you're doing that, you may as well do a contract then it's done. Um, the verbal contract will still apply. So the offer that you've made in the absence of a written down contract will still apply as well as all um, statutory and regulatory elements that are applicable to the role. So really, even if you don't issue a contract, the basics are there covered and given to the employee by law anyway. Um, so there's no protection for the business really in not offering a contract from day one. And if you think about the cost of not issuing a contract, well, there isn't one right away, um, but a lack of contract may increase your risk of dispute. If you end up with a dispute, that may increase your risk of a tribunal claim. If you end up with a tribunal claim, you're then in a position where there's a, a potential penalty there for that lack of statements of main terms of between two and four weeks pay of any on top of any award, award, award awarded. <laughs> um, and you also need to factor in with that, the cost incurred, kind of sorting everything out, management time, potentially legal fees, all of that stuff takes up time, important time and resource um, for you as business leaders or business owners. So really the costs are much wider than two to four weeks pay. It's also worth thinking about implied terms. If you don't have it written down, an implied term is what actually happens in practice or your statutory obligations. An implied term will still be legally binding. Um, so as an example, it's an implied term that, that you, you have a duty to provide a safe workplace for people. So whether that's written in the contract or not, that's still there, it's implied. Equally, there's an implied duty of mutual trust and confidence that might not be in the contract, but it's mutually assumed and, it, and implied that you both have the right to have trust and confidence within one within each other throughout that relationship. So really, um, in my view, it's, it's remiss not to bother with the contract. You, it, it allows you to protect both yourself, the business and, starts you from a good point with that employee relationship. 
So if we look briefly at what should be covered in this main statement of terms, or if you're going to go the whole hog in the contract of employment, we should be including who the contract's between, and start date, whether any continuous service applies, a job title or a br very brief description of the duties that are to be carried out. I wouldn't recommend including a full job description in a contract because in today's world and particularly with um, SMEs, there is a huge requirement to be flexible and fluid to suit the changing needs of the business. Um, you want to include in there how much people are going to get paid and how often remembering that the um, minimum wage will apply, of course, holiday entitlement and the right to any other leave. See, all of these things probably do seem like common sense, um, but certainly from my perspective, too often I see employers being rel reluctant to commit things in writing, um, when re in reality, without doing that, um, you know, and documenting things like working hours and and when breaks are and if they're paid or unpaid, that can really lead to a lack of clarity for people and for employers. And that that can lead to a wider escalation of issues, which ultimately we want to reduce and minimise where possible. And as discussed on the previous slide, whatever you do in practice could become an implied term anyway. So you may as well write it down and you may as well agree it in the form of a contract. So there's no confusion expectations are set and clear and managed between both parties. The next kind of key area that we touched on was um, in relation to right to work checks. So we've got your new starter, you've got their main statement of terms or their contract of employment that sets out the obligations of both parties, what they're going to get in return for the work they're going to carry out for you. That's great. But um, we then have the very, very important matter of a, a right to work check. So ideally, a right to work check should be made prior to a job offer. But in practice, I acknowledge that that rarely happens for various reasons. But one, one sort of secondary layer of protection I've put in there is that any offer made should be really subject to the proof of acceptable right to work in the UK. Right to work checks are regulatory compliance, so you have to do them. And really, you need to be applying this across the board. If you don't apply it consistent, consistently, then you potentially put both yourself and the business at risk of a discrimination claim if we're, you know, just picking and choosing who we ask for right to work. And if you don't complete the right to work checks, then you fail to provide yourself and the business again with what's known as a statutory excuse. So a statutory excuse is your first line response, if you like, when challenged. Um, and, and it's the first layer of protection against liability because you have a statutory excuse. You are able to say, I've done everything I needed to do to ensure that I was employing legally and responsibly. I do have another poll and then I promise that that will be it for your <laughs> input for now, certainly till the Q&A. Um, Camille, if you wouldn't mind launching the next one. Uh, yeah, just going to launch that now. So um, what are the repercussions of employing illegally? Do we think? Just going to give people, and this is a multiple choice, by the way. Um, so there's potentially multiple answers on this one. So uh, I'll just give people a little bit of time to, to give that a look over. It's really interesting seeing the results going up in, in real time. Um, I, will, I will share them in a second. <laughs> Just want to give people a bit of time with the, the multiple choice options. Okay, most people have answered, so I'll just quick share the results of that. Um, so most people have sort of voted that there'd be a £20,000 fine per illegal worker. Um, we've had quite a few answers in as well for damage to the business reputation, um, prison as, as a potential outcome as well, and also workers having their earnings seized. Thank you. So, uh, 
Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. All of those things apply. So the potential repercussions of employing illegally in very extreme cases can even include closure of the business, prison for the individual responsible for employing an illegal worker. And illegal workers themselves have, you know, the prospect of having their earnings seized because they've been and illegally and directors themselves can also find themselves disqualified so really it's a five minute job and we should all be doing it across the board as early as possible in that at the start of that employment journey but and um, that's all well and good but what are your obligations really so just some headlines and each case will vary wildly so i would urge anybody that's got any specific questions to either um obtain some specialist advice on the matter or as a starting point a really good place to look is the government website if you search right to work there's tons and tons of information there for businesses and for employers but some key things to be aware of i guess um, from the 1st of April, so from Friday, biometric residency permits are no longer acceptable right to work documents. That's because everything's moving online. So a biometric residency permit is like a little card that looks a bit like a driving license. And um, in sort of days of old, that was one of the, the top and most easiest to identify proofs of right to work. Um, a right to work check won't have been completed properly if you have accepted a biometric residency permit from Friday you will have to go online to the employer checking service to fully complete that right to work check the card itself is only now acceptable proof of identity it's not proof of right to work or rent um second thing to bear in mind is that um and probably really useful for for businesses is that Virtual right to work checks have been extended again. They were due to end in April, but they've been extended again to September, the end of September this year. And that means that an employee can take um, a scan or a photo of their right to work document, send it to you by email, and you can validate that by um, video call virtually. Um, you need to be looking that obviously that person looks like the person in their identification document and um, they must always be stored securely. Um, it's a really good practice to offer um, each individual coming into the business a copy of a fair, pro fair processing or privacy notice and that document would outline what of their data you're going to collect, what you're going to use it for, who you're going to share it with and where you're going to keep it. Um, and anything that's time limited, so if we're talking about um, a right to work document that has an expiry date on it, you really need to be creating a reminder for that time limited right to work document so that you follow up and repeat that check again to make sure you've got that statutory excuse. My HR toolkit has functionality within it if you are an existing customer um, to upload a right to work and expiry date and ensure that you get a prompt or a reminder. So those are your general obligations in relation to right to work. It is a vast, vast topic and it is ever changing, particularly with the situation um, with Brexit and, you know, this move to online checking as well. Um, so we're not going to go into more detail than that. But if anybody has any specific questions, then um, feel free to potentially connect with me afterwards or, or whatever to, to talk about those in a bit more detail. We'll move on then to the third kind of hot spot, if you like, of remaining compliant, and that is your policies and procedures. So in terms of legal requirements, interestingly, um, you are legally required to have only three policies. Um, that's your health and safety policy if you've got more than five employees. Um, you're required to have a disciplinary and dismissal policies, and you're required to have a grievance policy. Those two are covered by the Employment Rights Act, Section 1. Um, but from a, a best practice perspective, I would recommend that you've got the following that are on the slide there. So absence, family friendly, by that I mean flexible working, maternity, paternity, shared parental leave, adoption leave, blah, 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 blah. anything related to families, um, capability policy, equality, diversity and inclusion policy, dignity at work, whistleblowing. These are all sort of good practice um, policies to have in place. However, 
in a small business, I accept that that can be a really big job pulling that sort of thing together. So in the absence of a policy or a procedure, then I would um, revert to the ACAS code of practice and the relevant part of that. Um, if ever you have an issue that sort of arises in one of those areas and you don't have a policy in place. If you follow the ACAS website for guidance, you, you can't really go far wrong there. Um, but top tips when applying policies and procedures, I know the next webinar is going to cover this in much more detail, so I won't um, spoil anybody's thunder, but um, the things that we always say to line managers and business owners is, is act consistently, investigate and document. Um, so don't assume everybody knows the rules <laughs> or that um, what's expected. It's your responsibility as a business leader to set the example and to make sure that people are aware. Um, is that we've talked about all these policies. It's great practice having those all in place, um, but it's not enough to just sort of have them in the bank somewhere. It's your job to make sure that people know it exists and how to access it. And that brings us on um, quite nicely, really, thinking about those top tips, particularly in relation to documenting things. Record keeping is absolutely essential for compliance in um, any level, but particularly when it comes to employee compliance. And the, the easiest way to make this simpler is with HR software or, or some other software document management system. Um, it, not only do you want to be doing the right things, but you also want to be seen to be doing the right things. Ensuring that you've got things like this in place demonstrate that you've got a commitment to your people and, in, and a commitment to doing things properly. Having specific software or robust filing systems in place will help you streamline processes, will help you maintain GDPR compliance because it's safely and securely stored. Um, and also, arguably, um, it will allow you to manage SR with relative ease because all the key information that uh, an employee is likely to request um, should be easily accessible and in one place and certainly um, that's one of the challenges that I've seen some of my clients face trying to pull pull together um, information to to fulfill a SAR without software can be quite quite a headache so how is all this useful and we're going right back to the beginning now um, thinking about all the effort that we've put in to make sure we've got the contracts right and we we're doing the right right to work checks we've got the right policies in place well doing that up front will allow you to protect your business further on down the line and some of the key areas and some of the key things that i come across in my work with business owners um is things like being able to uh, make deductions from salary payments for things like investments in training damaged equipment any monies owing throughout the course of or upon leaving employment without that express agreed term in the contract um, the business can be exposed because if they deduct that money it may give rise to an unlawful deduction from earnings claim um, the, the second thing that we see an awful lot is uh, pylons, so that's pay in lieu of notice and garden leave. Again, if these are not an express provision contractually, um, then your attempt to apply pay in lieu of notice or to put somebody on garden leave could leave the company liable to a potential be breach of contract claim, which again, we want to avoid. Um, notice periods, that's, that's a really good one because although there are statutory notice periods in, in place if you've got a key individual that person might take a really long time to replace and you might therefore want to consider applying a longer notice period which protects you and allows you greater time um, to source a replacement if necessary but it also demonstrates your commitment to that individual from an engagement perspective they're really important to you they're really valuable um, to your business so you want to give them that notice both ways and um, but it does work both ways so be mindful that you might be, end up tied to that person for longer um, than you expect moving on to the right to work checks we talked about this on the right to work slide you need that statutory excuse you want that first line response having a basic legal defense in a potentially um, stressful and scary legal situation it's not only reassuring to have it there in the bank but it will save you time effort resource stress all the rest of it should something come up in the future and you've got to go back and and 
complete right to work checks for the entire workforce. Who knows um, where the business might be in two, three, four, five years time in terms of size and, uh, you know, and headcount. And finally, um, the clarity and transparency, I've, I've lightly touched on this throughout, really, um, from an engagement perspective, retention, you know, all, all that good softer stuff um, that, that applies to employees, demonstrating that you are willing and prepared to be transparent and clear and make sure everything's written down and done properly, if you like. Um, make sure that everybody's got clear expectations. There are no surprises. You know, and this will allow you to develop and, and grow your workforce if that's what you choose to do um, in such a way that not only have you done everything properly, but everybody knows you have to. And that's a really good place to start. Um, the first step. So um, hopefully you've all sat there going tick, tick, tick. I've got all of that. I do all of that already. But if you don't, what can you do? Well, the first thing I would recommend, and it can be an arduous task depending on your headcount, is completing a bit of an audit. Check what you've got and what you've not. Um, get your red flags first. So that's your contracts and your right to work checks. I would say the most, most, most important things that you should start with um, and tackle those red flags first. Look at investing in software if you haven't already, because this can really help with admin heavy processes. You can use the system, whichever system that is, to remind you and prompt and to just streamline everything, um, which will make a better use of your time, really. Um, think about reissuing your contracts. If they're out of date or you've got the odd one missing uh, for people, signed employment contracts will help you now not only now but also in the future and it's good practice I would say to reissue your contracts as a minimum every three to five years just to reflect legislative changes and best practice um, really so I think that's probably a really good place to start and then finally your policies and and or handbook should be reviewed regularly in line with changes to legislation and I said it earlier it's not enough to just say well I've got one um, you know, we really need to make sure that it is somewhere, such as in your HR software. Um, it's in there and, and everybody can access it as and when they need it. It should be a point of reference. People should think, oh, I wonder what I do about this. Go to the handbook, find it. Job done. We hope. That brings us to the end. Um, and thank you. I'm not sure how I've done for time, whether I've whistled through or drawn on. But uh, thank you very much, everybody for listening. Hopefully you found some useful um, information and top tips. That's all good. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That was really a great overview of just what is a huge, 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 huge topic. Um, and I think we're having a, a couple of people in the chat saying thank you as well. We've got Louise, Maria, Sophie sort of chiming in. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, also got a few questions coming in in the Q&A already. Um, I'm going to just run a very quick poll uh, while we sort of just give everyone a bit of time to um, get their questions into the Q and A. Um, more for, for, for my interest than anything. So just indulge me here a little bit. Um, but um, I'd be interested to know if anyone is interested in hearing more about how software can help you sort of with compliance. Because as Charlotte mentioned, um, about sort of software solutions, they can be quite useful. Um, so I'm just going to launch that quickly. So um, for anyone who wants to, to answer if they're interested in sort of learning more about software and how that can help. Um, so I'll leave that running for a little bit. Um, but yeah, we do have quite a few questions coming in on the Q&A, which is always nice to see everyone getting involved. <laughs> of course, we have some, uh, Tim said in the chat, thanks both. Why does everything get more complicated instead of simpler? <laughs> I know, <That's> right? <laughs> yeah, it's a proper proper labyrinth, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, are we even getting stars sent in as well? People are loving it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charlotte. It was really informative. Um, thank you. So I'll move on to the Q and A because yeah. yeah, we do have a, a few bits coming in. Um, so. I'll um, 
move from from one of the earlier questions we got um uh, selena asks could you repeat the three legally required policies yes to, so to recap yes thank you selena so the first legally required policy is a health and safety policy and that applies if you've got five or more employees um, the second two are covered by the employment rights act and the policies that you are required to have in place are disciplinary and dismissal I would just call that a disciplinary policy, but a policy that deals with disciplinary dismissal issues and uh, a grievance policy. If you don't have those in place already, then um, as I said earlier, the ACAS code of practice is a really, really good place to start and providing you following their framework and their guidelines, you can't go far wrong with that. Okay, brilliant, fab recap, thank you. <laughs> um, and Mal Gazata has asked, how important is it to countersign ID documents? Now, because um, this is more of a good practice issue, if you like, because of the changes, it is really important that you have an acknowledgement of the person that has seen it. But the days of old that says, I hereby declare, blah, 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 th this is a true and whatever, that that isn't required. What you do need to do is have um, the name of the person that checked the ID, if you like, and it needs to be date stamped so you know when you completed that check. Um, the big long spiel doesn't really need to be, it's not really relevant anymore. As a really good example, um, some of my clients will have send the right to work document for processing in terms of upload into their system and in the email they'll say I can confirm that I saw this person today and this is them that's enough as long as you've got the date stamp and who completed the check that's adequate cool brilliant I uh, know yeah I think that's a good overview of that um we do have a question in from Elizabeth who asked what is an SAR or a SAR? <laughs> Sorry, that is me using jargon without explaining it. So a SAR is a subject to access request. And um, in line with GDPR regulations, an individual, we'll talk about this just from an employment perspective because a SAR applies in the rest of the universe as well, in every capacity where data is stored and used. An employee can write to you and put in a subject access request. So can an ex-employee. I should have caveated that, um, saying I would like access to all of my data, please. And that is what a SAR is. And then you then scurrying around if you're in filing cabinets, um, trying to find, pull, pull together bits and pieces of paper to photocopy. It's hard work. I'd be remiss not to say this would be a great uh, area in which to get a HR software solution <laughs> to help you find the, the information you need. Um, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but my HR toolkit is a, is a great solution for that. <laughs> That's my sales pitch out the way. <laughs> Okie doke. Thank you for that question, Elizabeth. Um, and Catherine asked, do you still need to keep paper copies of employee files as well as storing them on HR software or electronically? If we're talking about general employee files, uh, the rules in relation to payroll data um, can be different. So I would, uh, we're just going to pull that out and park it. But your general employee files, no. It's good practice to have a copy, a hard copy of the signed contract. Um, and, and I probably would have recommended that two plus years ago, but actually um, we're seeing that we're moving to a virtual world and many, many people um, choose to have their contracts signed electronically. So what's the point in printing it out and saving it? Yeah, better for the environment as well, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> you know, in the same electronic signature providers, software, whatever it is, um, are, legally binding so in terms of having that protection um it's there with that so i think it is it's really not necessary unless it, you've given it to a person and they've signed it with a pen i wouldn't hold on to anything okay well, brilliant thank you uh I a question in from jane if you want to renew contracts do you need to consult with employees first and how would you do that 
Right, <laughs> this is a long-winded one. So if you want to renew contracts and you aren't really changing any of the fundamental terms, so we're not talking about changing um, job titles, working hours, holiday, pay, benefits, all that stuff. If you're just updating them, um, just so that you've got nice, new, fresh, compliant contracts on file, then um, you can reissue the contract with a nice covering letter that explains what you want to do and um, open up, it's good practice to have a consultation period, so open up a window of time in which an individual can approach you on a one-to-one -one basis and have a consultation if they wish. Um, if it is a simple refresh, then more often than not, certainly in my experience, um, people will take it away, have a think about it, maybe ask you the odd question, return it signed, um, or you know, if you're doing it electronically, it'll come back to you signed. Um, if you are changing any fundamental terms, so you do want to make changes to things like working hours, then yes, you will need to um, undertake consultation with the individuals. Um, and, and that really depends on what's in the contract already, what you're trying to change and what the employee's view on that is. So there isn't really a one size fits all answer to that. Sorry. Sorry, Jane. No, great overview though on, yeah, again, what is a pretty, pretty complex area for sure. Um, so thank you for your question, Jane. Um, um, so Catherine asks, whose responsibility would it be to complete and write the policies and contracts with an SME, a director, manager, administrator? I think that's a really good and interesting question, Catherine. My opinion on this is that all three need to have input. And the reason being, it's all well and good, the administrator typing the policy up because it's an administrative job. But actually, um, a policy or a, a procedure or a contract is part of the culture of the business. And that has to start at the top and, and be fed down. It has to come from the top down. So I think that. It, if they're in the absence of a res person responsible for HR, it would be good practice for it to be a collaborative effort, or at the very least that the, the director or owner um, gives an indication of what it is they want to achieve with that policy or contract. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, a good question that came in from Maria. Um, who says, you mentioned training should be outlined in the contract. Could you expand a little more on that, please? Yes. So if you offer um, training on the job or external training, it should always be referenced in the contract to outline what the expectations are. So um, off the top of my head, an example might be, you may be required to undertake training. Um, this might be internal or external the company um, will bear the cost of that training. However, if you leave within six, 12, 18 months, then this proportion of the cost would be clawed back. It's also a good practice to outline who is gonna meet the cost of the training. So it might be that um, a separate training agreement is, is signed and created if you're sponsoring somebody or you, that you're paying half or just to outline the, the terms of that agreement so that if somebody we see it a lot. If you put somebody through um, a particular course and they're qualified and they've got a certificate and they can take that and use it somewhere else and they leave three weeks later, you spent all that money for what? So you want to be able to claw some of that back from a business protection perspective, but from an engagement perspective, you want to be clear and transparent. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got quite a few questions coming in now. Um, we are finishing at, at quarter two, so uh, I probably won't be able to get all of them, but hopefully we'll have a, a sort of a, a good variety answered. Um, one question that we had coming in, is it satisfactory for the responsible um, HR contact to sign contracts on behalf of the company? Yes, if they've been given the consent to do that. Um, if it's an existing, more often than not, you will start with a master contract template. So you'll have standard terms and then you'll tweak that for each individual. And in that case, you are familiar with the ins and outs and the terms of the contract. So I see no reason why that wouldn't be an appropriate signature on a, on a contract. 
Brilliant. Um, another question we had in, uh, do we need an employee handbook if we already have a set of policies? No, not necessarily. It is um, personal preference. I prefer to have an employee handbook because it's all in one, one place and you can use the contents page, um, but equally it's fine to just have a set of policies instead. Fab, I'm, I'm obviously selecting some quick fire ones, which is good because we've got quite a few coming in. Um, uh, Torsif has asked, um, do the old systems such as Excel sheets for absences and holidays work for small businesses or is the use of HR software essential in today's business? In my opinion, the use of HR software is essential. Um, you can get some really cost effective solutions. It minimizes admin time. You can delegate responsibility for things. Um, people can self-service their holidays so they can have a look at what everybody else is doing and when they can book appropriate time off. That's much, much easier than an Excel sheet that says viewers read only because somebody's in it. Um, it's just slicker, it's smoother. And from a GDPR data protection security perspective, it's also really good practice to make sure that you've done that. Yeah, we, we often find with, with customers coming to us is that they've sort of started to outgrow the, the spreadsheets and the, the calendars and things like that, um, especially with more sort of remote and hybrid working now as well. Um, it is just much, much easier for people, I think, to, to have that kind of online system. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question, Tulsi. Um, okay, we just got a few more in. Um, well, one question we do have that's come in that I can answer. Um, <laughs> will you be running another discussion concentrating on the policies that should be in place? And uh, yes, yeah, our next webinar will be focused on policies and procedures. Um, just another advertising opportunity for me here. Um, oh gosh, I've had quite a few um, comments in the chat, but I'm just going to copy and paste in that link to the next webinar. So if anyone's interested in finding out more about policies and procedures, and um, that's the, the webinar that's coming up next. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd, I thought I'd put that question in. <laughs> um, okay. And um, another one we had in, um, Rachel has asked, can the key policies be listed in the employee handbook or should they be separate documents? No, it can all be included in the employee handbook. And then I can just see the second part of your question as well, Rachel. If an employee has a salary change and job title change, a letter would suffice to confirm these changes. Absolutely right. That's called an addendum to contract. So you're just making a change to one or two little bits in the contract, such as, you know, you're not going to issue a new contract every time minimum wage goes up if you pay somebody the minimum wage. So, yes, that's more than more than adequate. Thanks, Rachel. Okay, and um, we've got a question from Malgazata, who asks, do we need to add in, con in into the contract all benefits that the company offers? Uh, for example, we're looking to add some benefits, will I need to add them to all contracts or change contracts? Here's my recommendation. I, if you put it in the contract, you can't take it back out. Um, if an individual is, well, you can, but it will be hard work because who's going to give up private medical or whatever. Um, so it is my view that some of the benefits, so the, the things that are um, you are entitled to private healthcare, to participate in the company's private healthcare scheme, the company res reserves the right to withdraw it and please see the policy for full details of the scheme. That means that you will always have to provide some healthcare um, but that you've got the scope then as the business grows, changes, develops um, to, to be a bit more flexible. What, whilst a contract is an amazing document to have to protect the business, what you don't want to do is um, restrict yourself too heavily by explicitly stating everything in there. But if an individual is going to be entitled to a benefit, then it should at least be headlined. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've got time for very few more question. Um, and um, Anne has asked, um, at the moment I take a copy of the passport or birth certificate for right to work checks. Should I do more, i.e. online checks as well? Um, I'm presuming Anne that you mean UK passport and a UK birth certificate. 
So that is adequate. Um, but the government's online checking system relates to um, people with different uh, backgrounds, nationalities, rights to work documents, essentially. Um, so that's enough for a UK resident and you don't need to repeat that check because you can see that they have the indefinite right to work in the UK, um, but anything alternative would need to be checked online properly. Fantastic, yeah, and um, that kind of brings us up to, to quarter two now. Uh, so sorry, there were a few questions we couldn't get around to because we had so many in, which is fantastic. Um, shows that obviously everyone's really passionate about the topic and engaged, which is brilliant. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Charlotte, for for your overview on everything and, and also answering people's questions and, and sort of giving your sort of insights into things. It's been really good to, to learn more about just how important employee compliance is. Um, yeah, people want to sort of join in the chat with any any feedback that you have for us, um, do, do feel free. Um, but I think for now, um, I'm you know appreciative of everyone's time. So um, I'll, I'll sort of wrap things up. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. It's been really great to, to do this webinar with you all today. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Charlotte. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you for your questions. And thanks, Camille, for having me. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.